Okay, so our speaker to today is Dr. Anthony Van Wolkham. Uh, he is originally from Holland, Michigan, but he currently lives in Rockfield, Michigan. He has um, a bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Michigan State University in entomology. He is currently a regional field coordinator for North Central Region US for minor use pesticide registration program uh, called the Interregional Project Number Four. Uh, he also tests uh, pesticides for chemical companies or for high school students making pesticides. <laughs> Uh, as well as uh, make sure that the products are working correctly. His master's degree was focused on trunk injection. And he injected apple trees with fungicides and insecticides uh, in a system similar to an IV system and a hypodermic needle. Uh, he tried to control major apple diseases and insect pests with this new and innovative pesticide delivery system. For his PhD, he focused on insecticide residue of apple and cherry and collected residue data to enhance international maximum residue limits. Um, so that farmers would be able to ship produce internationally easier. He had to figure out what to spray, when to spray, and at what rate to obtain a specific amount of residue that was legal for consumption and shipment to countries with different legal limits. So in other words, he knows what he's talking about. Um, Dr. Tony Van Walkum, the time is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. That's, uh, that was a good intro. <laughs> okay? You guys are okay? Yeah, so I've, I've been doing a lot of insect work over the past so 12 years at Michigan State. Um, so I, I, I guess as an entomologist, they, they really call themselves um, pesticide scientists. Um, there's some entomology work, but we work so closely with plants that really it's plant pathology and entomology and a little toxicology um, as well. So this fits in really well with, with chemistry um, as well as uh, the other natural sciences. But you can see the little triangle there on the first slide as with plants, chemistry, and insects, um, they go together so well, because if you're, if you're missing one of those links, you're really not gonna know what you're doing when you're trying to um, control a pest. Um, you have to know the plant, you have to know how it acts, the phenology, and you have to know the insect, um, the life stages of the insect um, to figure out how to control it. And you have to know the pesticide, the chemistry. If you don't know how the chemistry works, then you can't control the insect, um, especially nowadays with so many species specific um, pesticides and insecticides. Um, they've come so far with insecticides. Um, they used to be very broad, a very broad range kill where you spray one thing like DDT or arsenic and it kills everything, including the animals nearby. So we don't want to do that. And um, they've, uh, chemists have come a long way to figure that out. So uh, a lot of the insecticides have come as far as only controlling one species of insect um, to only act on a certain nerve or a certain synapse or a certain receptor, binding receptor area of the insect. And it'll block that and it will kill it. Um, there's hormones. 
um, hormonal insecticides, nerve poisons. There's insecticides that work on sodium channels. Um, and also different uh, certain receptors called ryanidine is, uh, receptors. So really specific now. Um, so it's very detailed. You, uh, uh, pretty much every area has to know about them to be able to control their, their insect problems, including farmers. So anyway, first I'll, I'll talk a little bit about mode of activity. So there's mode of activity, but there's also mode of action. Uh, mode of activity of an insecticide is the field assemble uh, symptoms of an insecticide's action on the organism that are responsible for control. Um, so the insecticide activity on a target pest is either going to be lethal, where you spray it on the insect and it's going to die, sublethal, and I'll talk about the, each of these individually, re repellency, and which is your, your classic mosquito spray, anti-feedant and oviposition deterrence, and there's a curative activity. Um, those are the five general areas of, of mode of activity of different insecticides. And these are a few examples. This slide shows the compound on the left. These are the major classes of insecticides. And you can look up the, it's called an IRAC poster or you can look up online all the different classes. There's, there's more than this, but this is the, the basic that I think is the most important. Um, the OPs or organophosphates, carbamates, pyrethroids, IGRs or um, growth regulators, um, oxidizines, spinosins, diamides, and neonicotinoids. So each of those have a different mode of activity. Uh, which is really important when you're trying to figure out how to kill a certain insect um, in your farm, in your farmer's field, or in someone's home, or um, in order to use it safely, you have to know how it works. So it's either going to be it has all the mode of activities for each lethal, like uh, curative, um, sublethal. So you can see down at the bottom neonicotinoids. It has all of them: lethal, curative, anti-feed, and overposition deterrence. So it has all those different modes of activity, um, which is interesting. It, it's considered more of a broad uh, spectrum sort of insecticide. Um, and here's a more complicated slide. I, I just wanted to quick show you um, how, how complex they are. Um, in red are the different classes of insecticides. And in green is their uh, mode of action and what they do. So first I showed you the general mode of activity and this is the mode of action. The mode of action is um, uh, cellular on what it's doing in the insect. Uh, it's either a nerve poison, um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it can, which is a nerve poison that causes the acetylcholinesterase um, to not be cleared out of the nervous system. That's, it's get, it gets complex, but it causes the insect to continue to um, muscle spasm. So <laughs> instead of clearing out the synapse, if, if you've, um, well, I guess maybe you haven't covered that at all, but once you, a muscle acts or a, a nerve goes through its action, the synapse runs through and that it has to be cleared out, reset before it can take another action. But this acetylcholinesterase inhibitor causes that chemical to stay. So it continues to fire the nerve and the muscle will continue to spasm and the insect can't move, so it dies. Um, so that sort of thing, there's sodium channels, certain chemicals that won't let pass through the insect anymore. Um, hormonal things where it won't let the insect go to the next stage. It won't let the insect molt. So essentially the insect implodes inside of its exoskeleton. <laughs> so it's really interesting on how, yeah. on how it works. It can, when it interrupts the hormones, specifically on insects. So it does not affect any other organism in that way. Um, of course, pet, in, pesticide residues can, can, um, can be harmful, of course, if, if consumed at, at, at high rates by anyone. But um, this is the only way that it acts on the insect. Um, chitin synthesis inhibitors, that's hormonal. So just, just an example of all the different ways they can act on the insect and how complex it has become. It never used to be this way. 
um, they used to just kill everything, nerve poison through everything. Um, well, which is why some old insecticides have become biological weapons uh, worldwide. Um, I think it was Kim Jong-un's brother or uncle, I think it was his brother who was touched on the face, on the cheek by somebody that had an insectic high concentration of, an, of insecticide, broad spectrum on their hand and touched it on his cheek. It went through his system and it stopped his heart almost instantly. So that's, that's how toxic they could be at certain rates, um, not just to insects, but um, the older ones. So I got a few pictures here that kind of describes uh, um, how, these, how these things work. So there's a nice picture of a moth here. Um, so the lethal activity, I'll talk a little about lethal activity first. Um, for adulticides, larvicides, and ovicides. So those are three stages of the insect. So the general term for is pesticide, but there's also insecticide and fungicide and herbicide for weeds and um, rodenticide for rats and mice. There's avicides for birds. Those are very general terms, but once we break down insecticide, within insecticide, there's ovicide, adulticide, and larvicide. Each can be very specific to that certain life stage, which is why you have to know um, how this insecticide works on the insect. You have to know the life stage that it acts on because they don't all act on the adults. If you spray a pesticide, it might not kill it because it's supposed to act on the eggs or the ovicide. So you spray it and it acts underneath the eggs, kills the eggs and they can't hatch. So, or the, then, then there's the adulticide where you spray it like a pyrethrin classic wasp spray. If you spray a wasp with it, the stuff you buy in the store, like Raid, it knocks it out of the air. Um, and it's a nerve poison. And it, it, um, it won't allow the nerves to continue to fire. So it'll lay there and start twitching its legs and constantly flicking its wings until it dies. If you don't spray it enough, sometimes the insect can come back to life. And the wasp, if you don't spray it enough, if it doesn't get enough into its system, it will lay there and revive itself and it can fly away. So that can happen too with some adulticides. Um, it has to be the right rate so to have successful control. There's larvicides and those control the larvae. So if you're gonna control the larvae, you would think that the insecticide is gonna to have to be able to penetrate because the larvae are generally inside the food or the fruit or the vegetables because they're not just going to be on the surface. You don't find uh, insect larvae just laying around. Um, of course, there's the ones that are external feeders um, on top of fruit or on leaves. Those are the ones that um, it's, it's easier to control, but those are going to be the insecticides that you don't need to have penetrable, penetratable um, qualities. You can just spray it on the surface and it'll, it'll kill the larvae. Um, so here's a picture of what some experiments look like. So that's me spraying in the tractor, spraying the cherry trees with an air blast sprayer. This is how fruit growers, um, as you I'm sure know, control their um, pest problems. They roll um, both ways and they cover the tree with full coverage. They'll spray the trees, come back and spray the other. Um, to make sure that every surface of that plant is covered to control the pests. So we'll spray it and we'll either pick the leaves, pick shoots, um, clip off shoots or leaves and we'll put them in these containers with some floral foam on the bottom. That's, this is one type of uh, experiment. And we'll cover the floor with wax so the water can't evaporate and so the insect doesn't burrow into that floral, floral foam it's forced to eat that fruit. Um, so you cover it and the insect is forced to eat fruit with insecticide on it. And we wanna see what happens. So it's really, a, you could call it a no choice test. It doesn't have a choice but to eat it, but we'll be able to know what happens and if, it, if it's effective. Um, and this is what happens when it's not effective. You can see all the damage on that apple on the bottom. Uh, it burrowed into the apple but it may have died 
from eating that apple. So we have to find out, did it consume it and die or did it consume it and not affect it at all? Uh, it's, that sort, it's that sort of thing. So you spray it and you pick the fruit um, with a certain time period. You let the fruit stay in the container within a certain time period and you, you count how long it takes um, or you measure the days that they've been in the container. One, three, seven, you could even do one week intervals where you check the insect every week and see if they're surviving. Um, this is a typical graph of what insect uh, experiments look like. Uh, it shows the percent live adults, percent egg hatch, and percent larval entries. So this kind of has everything. Um, if the adults survived, did the eggs hatch that it laid? And how many larval entries are there? How many holes did the larvae cause in the fruit? Um, this is the classic coddling moth. This is the worm in the apple, you could say, that you see on TV. And the different in compounds on the bottom. Um, and there, there's a control on the right. So the one on the right, control wasn't sprayed with anything. So, and you can see 100% the adults are living, the eggs are hatching. Um, then there was a few larval entries in that fruit. And then um, the next one down to the left is Guthion. That one is now banned. It's illegal on fruit. It wasn't just a few years ago, but the EPA banned it because it was too toxic to the other um, non, um, non-target, you could say, um, uh, organisms like bees, honeybees or animals or anything. Um, it was negatively impacting them too much. So they banned it. Uh, it works well. You can see on insects, though, the uh, number of adults and egg hash is way down compared to the others. Um, and just another example of what these uh, different classes of insecticides on the left um, and the life stage activity that it affects. Um, on the next column, you can see each class infects different life stages of the insect. Not all of them are the same. Um, not all of them have adult. These, these, the last two on the bottom don't control adults. The one with uh, coddling moth virus in the middle here only controls larvae by ingestion. They have to eat it. Uh, and the mode of exposure, the last column on the right, is has to they have to have contact or they have to ingest it in order to become effective. So. Very specific. It had to, it has to be that complex in order for them to be safer for um, humans. Otherwise, we're going to be affected too if it's too broad of a poison. Um, so here's a few uh, illustrations on, on what they do. A repellent causes the insect to avoid the substrate totally, like uh, uh, DEET in mosquito spray. They won't. They don't like the smell or they don't like the taste. So they'll just fly away. Um, Anti-feedants or oval position. Deterrence, they reduce the desirability of the crop as a food source or egg laying host for the pest. So they don't want to lay an egg on it um, because it's not safe. They can smell it, they can taste it, they can sense that it's not a good spot to lay an egg. So not, uh, not a safe spot to reproduce. So no feeding either. And here's a quick example of what residues look like graphically. So that last slide I showed you, if they don't want to lay an egg on it, or if they do lay an egg on it, you have to have an insecticide that penetrates the fruit um, to a certain level. Otherwise, the, the egg will be laid and it's going to survive and eat the fruit. So you can see the neonicotinoid column on the right. Zero is the surface of the leaf. Right in the middle of the graph is the surface. And you can see the residue penetrating below the surface with the, um, with the um, what do you call it, the checker. The red checker pattern is below the surface of the leaf. And the solid red is the residue on top of the leaf. So neonicotinoids penetrate the leaves well um, and fruit. You can see foliage and fruit. Um, so it works well to penetrate both leaves and fruit. So that's probably a good chance it's going to kill the larvae um, that have um, penetrated the fruit, which makes it a good curative activity, which means it cures the problem. If, there's a, if there is a problem already, you haven't prevented it, 
and there is a problem, then you can spray this to cure it. So that's why they call it curative activity. Um, organophosphates on the left I have, are still, it's a very toxic, one of the most toxic pesticides still on the market, that class. And they don't penetrate much. They just stay on the surface um, and kill anything that lands or tries to eat it. So just a quick example of how we, we'll try to graph residue on the surface and below the surface of fruit and leaves, um, because we have to know how, how they act on the, the, the plant material in order to, to control the pest. So another example of why plant pathology is, is a big deal for insect people in, in agriculture, that is. Um, so curative activity that I was mentioning is a lethal action of a pest post-infection. So it's been infected and a, a farmer, a grower has a problem and they have to fix it. So they're gonna result, uh, so it results in the transitory penetration of an insecticide into the tissue. You can see the fruit tissue there and the little beetle walking along. Um, but we're, tr we're not trying to control in right now. We're trying to control that larva that's underneath the leaf surface. So you have to have a spray that penetrates to reach it. Otherwise you're never gonna touch it and it won't affect anything. It's gonna eat your fruit or, or um, defoliate the tree or plant. So a quick graph of the curative activity of insecticides on a specific insect called plum curculio. That's a beetle larva. And you can see the average number of larvae per fruit um, on the bottom there is very large in the control that has no treatment. And thiamethoxam is a chemical that penetrates fruit very well. That's one of the best for penetrating. So you're gonna get good control, which it did. There were not many uh, larvae um, per fruit for thiamethoxam because uh, they were gone. So that's, that's a good example of how those modes, uh, modes of action work. Um, Sublethal activity, it reduces the fecundity or non, our non-viable eggs. Um, so the, the, the insect will lay the eggs, but the eggs will die and they won't hatch. Uh, so it's, it's more of an indirect pest control. You're not killing it straight up, spray it, it's gonna die, or it penetrates the fruit, it's gonna die as soon as it touches it. It won't, it, it allows the, uh, um, the fruit or leaf to stay clean because the insects don't wanna lay eggs, or they, they'll lay the eggs on it, but then they'll die. So a little different, They're, the pests will be around, but they won't be effective. They won't hatch and they won't, um, uh, defoliate or eat the, the fruit. And let's see, yeah, this is just another visual. A, it's oval position deterrence, so no eggs on the uh, top left picture. B, anti feedant, they don't want to eat that leaf. C is repellency, they just fly near it and fly away because they sense there's something wrong. And D on the bottom left. There's a little larva under in there under the underneath that plant material, and um, it's it's going to kill the larva because it penetrates. And then there's sublethal, which I just showed that um, they just don't they don't hatch. The eggs won't hatch, and they're just non-viable. So in general, this is kind of a to, to summarize that the insecticide mode of action and mode of activity. Um, the 20th century pest control is, was an industrial age, but there's time for another poison because it, the, the amount of toxicity that those insecticides had on humans was out of control and um, very effective. We had very clean fruit and it was very cheap and it was easy to use. All they had, the farmers had to do is throw it in their spray tank and away they went and you're good to go for at least a week or two. <laughs> but um, it, things had to change. It was um, negatively affecting everyone. Um, so the 21st century uh, was the informative age. Uh, so what optimal selection IPM of tools is best to exploit the pest weakness across the life stages 
um, utilizing the lethal, non-lethal modes of activity to manage the pest population and protect the crop. What, are, what other ways can we um, control these insects without having to spray these toxic poisons everywhere that are so effective? Um, in my master's work that um, Desmond mentioned, I injected, I tried doing a project that, um, it's been around, trunk injection's been around, um, the emerald ash borer, you might remember, I don't know, I feel like I'm already too old and I'm only 34, but the emerald ash borer came and ate all the ash trees. And there was a company called Arbor Jet was one of the first to start injecting um, ash trees to kill the larvae. Um, and it worked pretty well, but there was just too much of it and you couldn't inject, couldn't inject every tree. There's just not enough time or resources. So people just managed to save some trees in their yards. Uh, landscapers started buying these materials and they just um, uh, started doing it lands around people's um, neighborhoods and yards. So agriculturally, was it feasible? No. Uh, injecting every single tree in an orchard uh, was virtually impossible. I injected hundreds of trees, but it's it, that's that's an experiment. That's not you're not um, doing this commercially. Um, but it was a good experiment. I, we learned a lot, and it's it works. We found out that injecting a tree can control insects and, and diseases, um, but you have to have a systemic insecticide or fungicide. It has to move within the plant and be able to um, keep the molecule without degrading. A lot of insecticides, they degrade. Um, they all do, except for some of the real old ones like DDT and arsenic. They can still be found in soils from 100 years ago, but the insecticides now degrade within just a few hours or even minutes. As soon as it hits the sunlight, the UV rays will degrade the molecule into nothing. So that means you're gonna to have to spray a lot because there's rain, there's temperature that affects it, there's sunlight, and we gotta find a way to spray something without it degrading so it's effective on the insect, otherwise it's worthless. So trunk injection worked pretty well. Um, but it's time, it's money, upfront cost is crazy, expensive, but long way to go, but it was a good start. Um, so there's a boring white slide, but that's just an intro slide. I'll, I'll show you a few of the major apple pests here, uh, just a few pictures just to give you an idea on what they look like. So the first little section there was what insecticides, what in general, what are they doing? Um, but this part just shows a few pictures I think you can see it okay. Um, this is the plum curculio that I mentioned. This is a beetle, the larva on the left and the beetle on the right. Um, this one will, the female will lay an egg. That's what, sorry, what that one's doing right there on the right, underneath the surface of the fruit. And that's a little apple. That apple is about the size of a thimble um, or a uh, marble. Um, and it lays an egg that soon underneath the surface of the skin. You can't see it, but when that fruit gets bigger, that scar that it left uh, expands, and that scar gets bigger and bigger, and it looks really ugly. Uh, nobody wants to buy it. Is it completely edible? Yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong with the apple, but people don't like ugly apples. They won't eat it. They taste the same, but it's just not marketable. This is what it looks like. There's like a half moon shape on the left there. That's that beetle cut a little tiny slit and laid an egg under there. And that larva will start eating the fruit a little bit on the inside and then emerge. Um, and that's a full grown apple on the right. And that's how big the scar will get. And if somebody looks at that, <laughs> I'm not gonna eat that. I'm gonna eat this honey crisp over here. That's nice and shiny. So that's just the way the market is. They, people won't eat it. Uh, but there is, there's becoming a market for damaged fruit, which is, I think, a good idea because it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It tastes the same. It just doesn't look very good. Um, I'll show you one. I'll just describe one life cycle here. Um, so of, the, of that beetle, the plum curculio, when the temperatures are favorable in the spring, so about June, mid-June, the adults leave their hibernation quarters, which is generally woodlots nearby. 
uh, underneath bark or leaves on the ground. And um, after the mating females deposit the eggs in the fruit, which is that crescent shaped damage, um, the larvae bore to the center of that fruit and mature and um, a lot of fruit will drop to the ground. Uh, so about two weeks, the larvae will leave the fruit and burrow into an inch of soil and emerge late summer to feed on apples again. So it's this vicious cycle of soil, um, hibernation quarters, um, burrowing to the center of the fruit emerging. And it's a, it's a major problem for fruit growers or any farmer, vegetable, field crops, corn, soybean, um, that, not that one, but that's how it works for, for all farmers. That's the insect life cycles. Um, this is another major pest, the oblique banded leaf roller. Um, they call it a leaf roller because it rolls up the leaf and makes a silky, um, it wraps its leaf in silk and that's how it, um, that's how it develops. And that's what the moth, adult moth looks like. The adults generally never do anything. It's always the larvae. That eat, that eat the fruit, the, the adults just fly away, mate, and make more. This is what the damage looks like. So that first damage I showed you was a direct damage. It directly fed on the fruit and damaged it. This pest has direct and indirect damage. So the oblique banded leaf roller eats the fruit just a little bit, and as the fruit grows, it won't grow where that insect fed. So it creates this big cavity or crease, big ugly mark, discoloration. On the left is indirect damage where the larvae will feed on the leaves too. Not all larvae do that. Some larvae feed on just the fruit, some just the leaves, but this one does both. So that's a big problem. But if you feed, it doesn't seem like a problem just feeding on a few leaves, but if you feed on a lot of leaves, it will reduce the fruit yield because the tree is damaged. So it, it indirectly impacts the, um, the yield or the, the crop load. Um, and I have another life cycle here, we can skip that. But um, another fruit pest, this is cherry fruit flies, cherry fruit fly. Another major pest, you can see you cut a cherry in half and there's the maggots inside. <laughs> so kind of ugly. And the adult fruit on the, uh, adult fly on the right. Um, kind of pretty, those, that pattern. On the wing, they call it an F pattern. You can see a little F right there on the left wing, right on the end. It looks like a letter F. A lot of fruit flies have that. Um, but people don't want to eat cherries with these maggots in them. Uh, they a lot of times don't know it. And um, fruit that you buy in the store generally does have some maggots in them, but you won't know because they're too small and they're they're probably dead, and you, it just doesn't matter. But if you have enough of them, it damages the fruit and you have to control it. So that's another good term to know, as there's no such thing as insect eradication, it's insect control. You can only control insects, you can't completely eradicate them. Um, there's some holes in the cherry there after the larvae emerged. Um, just a general life cycle, we'll skip that one. The oriental fruit moth, that's another picture of a major pest will feed on both again. We'll feed on the leaves and the fruit. This is what the fruit looks like when they burrow a hole into it. And when insect poop, they call frass, a fancy name for insect poop. <laughs> but they push that frass out to the front of the fruit and you get all these little gross things. Um, indirectly, you can see the shoots are dying because that larva burrowed straight into the center of that shoot right on the end and the front, these front leaves will die and the, those shoots won't grow any bigger. That's the terminal shoot, the most important shoot of the plant. In order for the plant to keep growing, it needs that end shoot to, to create more. So you, you can't have those shoot, the end shoots dying. Um, and also causes the less yield on the, on the crop. So, and this is the coddling moth that I showed you burrows to the center of the apple and eats a bunch of the apple and then comes back out and forms into a moth. Another ugly picture of direct damage on fruit, burrowing into the fruit. Um, a lot of these moths will overwinter as little pupae or cocoons in the ground or hiding in crevices and cracks in plants. Here's an apple maggot. There's a fly of 
fly pest of apples. Same thing, burrows into the center. Blueberries, blueberry maggot. Um, same sort of thing. It hollows out the fruit and creates this gross little raisin. Um, all dried out and nobody wants uh, to eat those. And it will bind them together with silk and just looks like a mess. So big problem here in West Michigan for blueberry growers. And I described what indirect pests tend to look like. Um, scale, scale is another insect pest to control with insecticides. Tricky to control because these scales cover themselves in a wax and they attach themselves to the plant. It looks like a barnacle. So it, you got to find an insecticide that can it penetrate that wax and kill it. Uh, and it looks like the has acne, all these red spots over it. People don't want to eat it. Um, does it taste bad? No, but people just don't want to eat it because it looks ugly. Um, green apple aphids is another pest. Aphids um, are a major problem of any crop, but for apples, it's the uh, green apple aphid. It will suck the plant material, uh, the juices, the, the sugar waters out of the leaves and stems and create dry brown leaves. And that's, this is kind of what the leaves tend to look like, all curled up and brown and the plant starts to die. And it won't last as long and won't create as much fruit or crop. Here's a leaf miner and potato leaf hopper. Potato leaf hoppers on the bottom right, that green one. And the leaf miners on the bottom left. And you can see the damage it causes on the leaves. The leaf miner is those spots on the top left. The leaf hopper is the top right where it's these leaves are yellow, yellowish. So lots of different, lots of different insects and pests. Mites, mites fall underneath entomology. Technically it's not, they're um, kind of like a spider, but they, <clears throat> they're, they group them into entomology just, just because there's not a big enough group of people to study them. So um, they, uh, we, we study mites on, on um, uh, for with insecticides too, we call miticides. So you have to try to control spider-like organisms because they also suck um, plant material out of the leaves. European red mite on the right is a big problem and the two-spotted spider mite on the left, two major pests. They, they come in millions and billions and they will suck the life out of these um, apple trees or many other crops. This is what they look like. It looked like you set the orchard on fire. They're burned and scorched because there's no juices. There's no sugar water, no nutrients left. So that hurts the plants. Um, so, and just uh, then I'll quick mention of something about invasive insects. There are a few invasive um, pests that are out. The spotted wing drosophila has been a problem for about 10 years now, so that's not exactly new anymore, but it was the biggest invasive pest that fruit farmers have encountered ever. Um, these little larvae were a huge problem on Michigan blueberries and cherries and um, raspberries specifically. Um, they just didn't know how to control them because they reproduce so fast and so quickly and they were resilient. They would last the winters. They would come right back strong. Um, and a, they could make some green fruit. So farmers had to figure out, well, we can't spray now because it's, it's bloom time. Like, then a spray timing came, and came to be a problem because they had all their honeybees out um, pollinating their orchards. They need those honeybees. And we don't want to spray insecticides when the honeybees are, um, are pollinating is then you're gonna kill your, your, your real beneficial pollinators. So when do you spray? <laughs> you have to control your crop, but also it's almost, some farmers were spraying at night when all the bees were in, um, that helped, but now you have a high residue for morning. Um, bees start um, pollinating in the morning as soon as it warms up a bit. So it was a challenge. Um, still a lot of research on spotted wing drosophila. Um, brown marmorated stink bug is a problem, but it's not as big of a problem as they thought. Um, 
right? It's actually just more of an urban pest problem. They're hibernating in homes like lady beetles do. Um, if you don't like that, I don't mind it. That doesn't bother me, but a lot of people don't like a lot of lady beetles in their windowsills, um, but stink bugs will do the same. They'll find a warm place to hibernate like a tree or in, in just inside of someone's siding on their home so they can um, survive the winter. But these came from Asia. They thought they were going to be a major pest. And um, it wasn't as big of a problem in Michigan because they can't survive our winters. Our winters are too harsh and they're too big um, to survive. And a lot of insects are very small and they can hide. Um, these are a little too big to hide. So our winters are pretty harsh here. And there's another one called the spotted lanternfly. I didn't put his picture up, but um, spotted lanternfly has not, be seen, has not been seen in Michigan yet, but is considered to be the next big one. And we're looking for it. So that'll be exciting. See, see when that one arrives. It's a, no, it's a leaf hopper. Um, yeah, this is what it looks like. Spray a lot of chemicals everywhere to get the food that we need. If we didn't have pesticides, um, I would tell you that we're, we wouldn't have enough food. <laughs> in general, for, um, for the population that's on the planet, you have to can be able to control the pests and make them make the food grow. Otherwise, we won't have enough for everybody. Um, you wouldn't think so, but it's amazing how much food that farmers make um, and how much pesticides, what a big deal they really are. Um, if you look at true non-pesticide field and compare it to a pesticide field, uh, big difference. There is almost no fruit compared to the one that was sprayed. Um, I, I could tell you that, I don't want to go too far into that, but um, organic versus non-organic, um, it is a fact that organic has pesticide. You probably know that, but it was a big, um, that was a, such a huge thing when the organic industry came in and said, pesticide free, it's organic. Uh, that is a lie. Um, organic food is sprayed with pesticide and it's toxic, just like any other. It is true that they did get sprayed with a different, different classes of pesticides that may not be quite as toxic for the initial, but they still have to spray more to control their pests because it's not as potent as the conventional products. So, I mean, you could say it's less toxic, but it's really not because you're now you're eating more chemical because they had to spray more. Uh, so it's a, it's quite a, it's quite a challenge to, to figure, figure that out. They put a USDA organic stamp on it, but it doesn't mean it's pesticide free. It's, it was sprayed with something that's considered organic and they've sprayed a lot of it. Um, and oftentimes organic farmers will park their fields next to conventional fields and they'll catch the drift of conventional products. So <laughs> it's a funny game. The organic industry is, is an interesting one. Um, but anyway, and this is what a typical spray card looks like, a research um, spray card. So when we want to spray an experiment, we have to come up with treatments. So like you guys want to do um, with a bioassay. So we have a computer program called ARM or Agricultural Management um, Stats Program that you can type in your treatments and you can see that the bottom left there, treatment number one, two, three, four, Number one, and we usually do it untreated to compare it to something. And it has the other treatments on there too of these insecticides. And it randomizes, because um, with any experiment, you have to randomize your plots. You can't just place them there. You have to have a randomization. Otherwise, statistically, you're gonna say, somebody could say that you were biased and putting some treatment next to another. So you have to have it mechanically or computer, a computer program to statistically randomize your, your plots. So here is, this is randomized. 
So it has a repetition one, two, three, four on the right side of that table. Those are the reps and it has the block numbers on there. 101, 102, 103, and we label, label those blocks with those numbers. And the computer program will recognize what those numbers are as what treatment and rep repetition it is. So with every treatment, you have to have a repetition. Otherwise, something can happen. Statistically, if you don't have something more addition, additional data to one piece of data, it means nothing because it could have been a miracle. It could have been um, just an outlier. You have to have many reps for each. Uh, we usually have four for each treatment, but experiments cost money, so you can't have 10 reps for each treatment. You can only have so many, otherwise you're gonna run out of resources. So you have to make it reasonable. And for any publication, any journal will accept um, three, but four is kind of an uh, icing on the cake for to have enough reps for your experiments. Um, yeah, this, this program is nice because it will lay out your plot in the field. It has 18 by 20 foot plot, it, you can measure it out. It, had, it will give your number of gallons that you put in your sprayer. It will give your gallons per acre, your rate, 120 gallons an acre. So it's, 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 it's really nice. It kind of calculates everything for you. So if you want to spray and do an experiment, you enter everything and it's, it spits out a spray card to fill up your spray tank and experiment some insecticides in the field. So you spray it, you pick your fruit or leaves, and or you go back out to the field and evaluate. Will these pests show up? Um, and what are they gonna do to your plot that you sprayed? So that's how uh, pesticides companies, pesticide companies work, like um, Bayer, Syngenta, um, all the big ones. Um, uh, Dow DuPont, they test their pesticides in this fashion. Um, they have to make sure they work and they, they have to, so they have to have efficacy, which is the efficiency. Do they kill the pest? Um, you have to have crop safety data. Is it safe on the crop? Will it hurt the crop? Because we can't have that. And then um, you have to have residue data. Is it safe for human consumption? How much residue is there on the fruit at harvest? So you have to run some chemistry too to run your samples through um, a thing called HPLC or high profile liquid chromatography and see how much residue is still there at harvest. Um, and uh, so there's a lots of things to consider. It, it takes, um, because I'm involved, I know how long it takes from beginning to end. It takes about six years to register one pesticide and make it legal to use which is a long time. So you wanna get started soon because there's, there's no way around it. You have to register it through the, the EPA. I work for a program called IR4. IR4 is called Interregional Project Number Four. It's a government funded program that um, registers pesticides on minor use crops. Minor use crops are fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, um, anything that's not corn, soybean, wheat, pretty much. Um, so that, those are considered minor use, which is funny. Why it, it's not minor, but acreage wise, they are minor compared to corn and soybean and, uh, and wheat. So they call it minor, minor use. And a lot of chem companies don't want to spend the money to experiment on minor use crops because it doesn't bring enough profit and they can't, money wise, they can't find it feasible or worth it. So there's a company called IR4 came into play in 19, early 60s, 1962, I think, and started registering these products for farmers. And it was really successful because they were willing to do it at a price that chem companies couldn't manage to do themselves. So um, IR4 has been around for quite a while. They had their 50th anniversary a few years ago and um, they're still registering crops every single day. They're, if you see a pesticide label, um, IR4 is probably the ones that put that crop on that label. If you read a, 
a label you have to find if is your crop on that label because you have to find if it's legal to use on the crop. So we put those crops on the label to make them legal for, for farmers to use. So it's um, pretty, pretty interesting. It's a lot of, a lot of people involved, government people, university people doing the research because you need the resources to do research and universities are some of the few places that have resources to do research chemical companies that have to supply the products and give authority to use their products. Um, the USDA and everybody has to, has to play in this game and all, they, we all have to play nice. Otherwise <laughs> we're not gonna get, um, get these, these good tools because uh, they're becoming more and more effective, but becoming harder and harder to use because the EPA is becoming more and more strict on what residues they want in the environment. So there's, there is a very sensitive line. Um, there's anti-pesticide people and um, there's pro-pesticide people and there's kind of people in between where they really just don't know. But pesticides, it's, it's a foreign chemical that's, um, it's gonna be toxic. And is it gonna be toxic to humans at any rate? No. Just like water, you could consider water as a pesticide. You can kill an insect with water. You can kill a human with water. If you drink enough, some people have been known to die to drink too much water. So it's really, it's a dose related toxicity. It's, um, there's, there's a formula where they say, uh, rate times um, exposure times the rate equals toxicity. So you have to be exposed enough and you have to have enough of the chemical to actually make it toxic. So when people eat fruit, they ask, well, is there a pesticide on it? Yeah, 0. 0.0003 parts per billion. Uh, by the time you eat it, uh, you could probably eat more pesticide than that. Picking up anything, a piece of organic, nothing, nothing sprayed on it. You could eat a piece of grass and probably get more pesticide. Um, you could probably breathe next to, uh, just breathe regular air anywhere and get more pesticides. So it's really, a, it's a dose. How much, how much are you willing to take in? <laughs> so it's, um, um, these compounds break down so quickly, there is almost nothing left. Um, and I know some of you guys are studying bactericides, uh, which is, that's an interesting group of pesticides too. Uh, you probably know the biggest one, Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it pretty much breaks down the gut of the insect. When they eat it, they have to ingest it, and they eat it and it um, just kind of tears their stomach apart and it, um, they can't feed anymore and then they just die. So that's a, it's still very effective and it works really well. So that was a great, um, a great discovery, BT. There's a lot of different BTs that work in different ways. Uh, that's just a general way to say it. It's BT. But uh, there's apparently BT fungicides now. I'm not sure how those work yet, but um, BT insecticides are the most common. But um, yeah, it's. I think you're 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 teaching a really good um, portion of this class because a lot of people just don't know about much about insecticides. They just kind of base everything on what they see on Facebook or anywhere, the media. Monsanto, what a rap they got. That was, that was something. Um, they are no, no longer Monsanto. I don't know if you know, but Monsanto was bought by Bayer for $66 billion. So Bayer, Monsanto is now Bayer, but they're gonna keep the name because it's such a big name. Um, but um, they, somebody made a mistake and somebody called them out on it. These mistakes get made all the time in this research, but nobody's been called out like they did. Um, and there's been much more harmful things done than Monsanto ever did. So it's, it's, it's a real funny thing. As soon as something gets caught in the media, they, they grab onto it and pull them across the world and make them look, look horrible. But I mean, all chemical companies are doing the same thing. They want to do the same thing as create pesticides and sell them to make money. And, um, but we need them. 
and we need them to um, produce enough food for the world. So um, unless someone can come up with a different way to do it, that'd be great. But this is, this is the most um, effective way to do it right now is, um, is to control the pest problems that we have with, with chemicals that are sprayed, uh, much less dangerous than they used to be. Uh, and that's been proven with lots and lots of data, but still they're toxic chemicals. So you gotta be careful with them and work with them uh, correctly and use them right. Um, and we do the best we can. So um, if something else is, comes up with nanotechnology or something to get, keep pests off of, off of crops and out of people's homes, um, sweet. But I think we got some time to go before then. And until then, we better keep our pesticides as safe as we can because it's they're pretty essential. Um, another interesting thing. So, just a quick side note. There is a just to, just to show how strict the U.S. is on their pests for the market. There's a company, Dannon Yogurt, and then you've all heard of Dannon. Mm -hmm. They had a problem with a customer that called and said, I have an insect in my cup, in my yogurt cup. And they said, okay, well, because there's a customer service on the, on the container, you have to have a number to call for anything. So somebody called and said, there's an insect, something with insects in my cup. So I, I'm gonna sue you. Hmm. They said, well, okay, we'll see how far this goes. They didn't make it because, you know, it, they didn't, they didn't get succeed, but they also said this won't happen again. And they, somebody else found something and called and said, if this happens one more time, um, this, this, this game is over. And it happened and Michigan blueberries, um, well, Dan, Dan and yogurt is now separated from Michigan blueberries because there was insect parts in the blueberry yogurt, which is just unbelievable. Um, it had somebody called and said there was an insect part or something in the yogurt cup and completely did away with and all of Michigan blueberries and tanning yogurt. So that's called zero tolerance. There's zero tolerance for any insect part or anything found in food, which is just crazy because they're everywhere. How can you keep something like a grain of sand, anything that you find everywhere um, out of your food? You can't. But if somebody complains about it and gets the law involved, um, there's, there's a lot of problems that happen. So that's, the U.S. has really zero tolerance when it comes to blueberries and insect pests. If there's one maggot found, so one more thing, an entire shipment load, a semi load of blueberries, can you imagine how many blueberries that is? Thousands of pounds and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of blueberries. As you know how much expensive they are when you buy them at Meyer or Walmart. Uh, the, an entire semi load of blueberries can be thrown away because of one maggot found in one blueberry, <laughs> which is unbelievable. And they, they just get thrown away or they get used for non something non edible non fresh market and that's um that's pretty sickening what a waste of food and resources so that's just how the that's how we work here uh, it's different in other countries but um there's zero tolerance for fruit pests and blueberries and that was kind of a legendary story about dan and yogurt but um it's it's no no mystery that there's zero tolerance for pests fruit pests i mean, um, it's not like zero tolerance in all crops, but fruit is one of them. It's very, very strict, which is why fruit pest control is such a big deal in Michigan, because it leads the way in agriculture for Michigan, and it brings in a huge economy to the state um, that we rely on, and we, we, sh we need to continue to, to protect it. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it, Desmond? <laughs> it is. It is. Are you willing to take uh, some questions and stuff now? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. You guys have questions? 
Speak up loud, say your name, ask a question. So um, I have a question. I have several questions. Um, the neonicotinoids, they, are in, they still are in um, a lot of use, common use. Um, but don't they also mess with the bees, especially? Um, I know you talked about that balance and the trouble, mm -hmm. and the, you know. Um, uh, how much of those neonicotinoids are still being used and what impact that has on the bee industry? Yeah, um, neonicotinoids are toxic to bees. That is no, there is no um, mystery behind that one. But uh, while well, Europe banned neonicotinoids, um, and it's a good example of how valuable that class of insecticide is, um, because all European countries banned it completely. It was in 2014, I think, because of how toxic they are to bees. And it's true. So they were trying to do the right thing, but unfortunately that wasn't the right thing to ban them completely because they found themselves with a big, a major problem with, with pests, such as spotted wing drosophila, hmm. becoming overtaken and they, they, farmers were going out of business. They couldn't survive. So European blueberry industry was taking a nosedive um, and because they banned other neonicotinoids um, because the honeybees sounded like the right thing to do. Um, but what needed to be done was um, concentrate on getting on outlawing people that are spraying them at the wrong rate, which is hard to do. I mean, how do you control what farmers are spraying at in the middle of nowhere? But it's, that's a tough one because they are affecting bees negatively, along with other insecticides too. Neonics aren't the only one, but they were a big one because they're sprayed at a time where there's a lot of bees around. So people end up seeing a lot of dead bees. That's a problem because as soon as someone sees some dead bees, there's a lot of bad press that's going to go around. Um, so the number of neonicotinoids has gone down. Some have been taken off the market, um, but they need to be sprayed at the right time. So appropriate IPM, you could say, integrated pest management, they have to be sprayed at the right time and at the right rate to affect bees in the least amount. Because um, at this point, most of agriculture wouldn't be able to survive without um, this class because been so many other classes taken off the market. I mean, it doesn't make sense to say that, but if you see the number of compounds that have been taken away from farmers, they've been given this one saying that this one is safe for humans, for human consumption, which is true, but now they're they're but they're still toxic to bees, which is a problem. So you really have to weigh it out and not just take it away. So there isn't, in general, there isn't uh, pesticides that could select good pollinators versus mm -hmm. bad. There, there are really not any of those around. Well, there's still a lot of research on that to be done to create insecticides that don't affect bees at all. And there are, but there's certain ones like neonicotinoids that are. And that class is has been has really been pointed to for affecting bees um, just because it is more broad. I showed you on that one there was a table towards the beginning where neonicotinoids uh, yeah well here's one neonicotinoids they affect eggs larvae adults with injection ingestion and contact and this table shows that they're lethal, curative, anti-feedants, over-position deterrence, that kind of covers all the bases. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a nerve poison that, that affects bees too. So they have to be used correctly and at the right time. Um, 
but how can you manage that? It, it's, that's tough. Um, I just don't see, um, I wish there was a class that affected bees less, um, but it's um, something you really got to weigh out. It's, you have to use it, use it correctly and at the right amount. Some people do not. Some people will spray anything at any time, which is illegal. So that's, that's a problem. But how are you going to control that? Ugh, a lot of money and a lot of resources to be able to control um, insecticide use that mm, I, don't, I don't think is, is possible. But um, so maybe somebody can come up with something better. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I had a master's project of trunk injection, so there wasn't anything sprayed in the atmosphere. It was all internally in the tree, and I did pollen, residue samples, um, nectar samples of flowers to see if that injection material was in the flowers that be, so bees wouldn't be negatively affected and that sort of thing. But pollination is a big, it's a big deal, pollination safety. Um, Michigan State University does a lot of entomology research on um, pollinators and the decrease of natural honeybees or natural um, bumblebees. A lot of people concentrate on the honeybees, but it's actually the native bumblebees that are disappearing even more. And honeybees, the European honeybee, Apis uh, mellifera, I mean, they're brought in, they're, harp, they're, um, they're grown, they're rented. Companies grow them, they rent them out for big dollars to farmers to pollinate their farms, but it's the native bumblebees that are actually becoming a bigger problem because we need these honeybees so much, why can't our crops be pollinated by what's here naturally um, to begin with? It's because there's no honey uh, bumblebees left, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. People don't really think about bumblebees too much, but there, there used to be so many different native bumblebees um, pollinating our crops that just aren't around anymore. They're disappearing um, and part of it's insecticides. So there's, there's uh, that's definitely true. Neonics affect bees negatively, and um, that's that's a research project that's going to be ongoing for a long time. Uh, <laughs> if, if you, but if you take if you take that class away completely, it's it's going to be a train wreck um, for the industry. Uh, I just I can't see it going away yet. There isn't another good option available. Uh, until there is, it's, it's going to be here for a bit yet. So what are some, what are some of, let's say the top three, the top three important pests in uh, Michigan? Um, in general or for fruit? Probably for fruit crops? For fruit, okay. Okay, uh, for fruit crops, the number one right now is spotted wing drosophila. Okay. That, for that fruit fly is devastating fruit crops here. Um, in Michigan, it's been doing that for almost 10 years now. Hmm. It's um, IPM or integrated pest management, um, which means spraying pesticides at times that you should spray them and managing them wisely and using cultural things, not just pesticides, but using cultural methods and using, um, making sure you spray in the right weather, um, using biocontrol pesticides, just integrating a lot of things together has kind of been thrown out the window because of spotted wing drosophila. When you have a pest that comes in from another country, there's no natural enemies because those, our insects haven't found it yet and they haven't decided that that's a good meal or that's a good host. So when new insects come in, it's huge. It's a, it's a major thing because there's no natural enemies, but over time it becomes one of our native insects like Japanese beetle. Japanese beetle used to be the most de devastating thing that we ever saw, but now a lot of our natural enemies have found it and um, numbers, it just became one of our regular insects here. So when something like spotted wing drosophila comes in, it creates pest management problems. It causes farmers to want to spray every single week. Um, toxic chemicals to the fruit. Um, otherwise, they can't harvest. They can't control it enough. There is the numbers are so large 
that by harvest time, they don't have any cherries left. In Traverse City, we wouldn't have any Michigan cherries if we didn't spray some of these toxic chemicals because the numbers were so high. I had um, some of the biggest growers in Michigan in Traverse City come here and tell us, what do we do? We're in trouble. We're gonna have to start shipping cherries from Washington. We're gonna have to get cherries from Europe, other, other countries, because um, this is just insane. The, the fruit is disappearing. Of all the flies are eating them. <laughs> we have to spray them legally. We can't just spray them with rates every day. We can't spray them. They can't afford it either. Pesticides are expensive, very expensive. It's every farmer's number one cost is pesticide. They, farmers do not want to spray pesticide. You, th you would think they do, but they do not because it's the only option they have to create crop to eat and sell and make money. <laughs> so they don't want to do it, but they have to. It's the number one cost. It's huge, huge money. So with the new pest, SWD is the number one, one. that causes so, lots of issues. So for some of our students here, I know you and I, and Dr. Smith have been talking about some possible <clears throat> insects that we could like maybe have access to through you. Yeah. Um, yeah, what are some of the ones that our students here could test their compounds on? Yeah, so we have two, um, the oblique banded leaf roller. Oh, I'll show you a picture of it uh, real quick. It's this, this one. We have this one available. And are you going to give us like have access to the larva or to the adult? We have both. Both? Okay. Yeah. Um, mostly the larva, probably. The adults, they're a little sensitive. Um, it'd be easier to just use the larvae, but we also have this one the coddling moth or the, um, the oriental fruit moth. Where's the coddling moth? Here. The coddling moth is the classic worm in the apple. Um, oh. Okay. Adults and larvae for this one too, but I would use the larvae because the adults are uh, they're finicky. They're hard to work with. If you take them outside in cold days like this, uh, it's going to be tough. So I would use larvae on both of these. Uh, you could try adults. I'm not sure how many I could I could give, but larvae I could give you quite a few larvae. Okay. I thought I was going to be able to give spotted wing drosophila. As um, I, I just think those are just too hard um, to keep alive. If they're not in the right environment for just a few minutes, um, they, they will die. They have to have the right climate. We have hum um, rooms that are specifically where we store them for the right, with the right humidity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are just too hard. They have to have the right diet um, all the time to, to survive. That's a, that's a really tricky one. So. So the say, lappers, um, are the ones you would uh, give us, and um, you would also tell us how to keep them alive, how to, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. You're from here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, were you thinking keep them several months and maybe create? Well, we more than likely, we will have compounds made by mid-January, early February, something like that. Um, so for right now, you know, it's not a high priority in getting them now. But okay. yeah, mid-January to early February probably is when we sure. were to, yeah. Sure, that's okay. Um, that worked fine. Okay. We, have, we always have them here. Uh, right. And whenever you want to uh, contact me and set up a time for someone to come and pick them up, uh, yep. Like everywhere else, this facility isn't open to the public, but if you come, I can come out and um, and give you some. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. You guys have questions? Anybody has questions? Okay. S uh, speak loud. Say your name. Ask a question. Did you hear what she said? No, I couldn't. Uh, 
Isabella, why don't you come down? Come down. I think she was talking about like the bugs and strawberries. Okay. Using hot yeah. water to take get them out, but she's gonna come down. Um, it was, it's about uh the okay, your mask. oh. <laughs> It's about this trend that's going around where people buy strawberries, they put them in boiling water and you can see this type of larva or bug that's uh, supposedly like immune to the, all the insecticides. They start oh. spraying out and trying oh. to get out. So I was wondering if this is a new thing when this is a new bug or if the public is just now realizing, hey, this isn't a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting because I've, I've, uh, I've heard that too. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because that is a perfect example of um, what the public doesn't know. Um, people have been eating food with larvae in them their whole lives and they, they just don't know. They don't know that. But when something like this becomes popular to start boiling your food like that, larvae are going to come out of it and you're going to see them. Not all the fruit, not a lot of larvae, but there's, there's going to be something because it's, it's what insects eat, um, just like what we eat. So you're gonna find them. Um, I'll tell you something interesting too. When we look for these larvae in the fruit, uh, one way that we do it is we um, will put the fruit, we'll, we'll pick the fruit and then put them in a water and brown sugar solution. And we'll, we'll mix it up. It's a certain ratio of brown sugar and water. It was, uh, Washington State University came up with it. It works really well you grab all the fruit with your bare hands and just squish them all like cherries and you just squish squish blueberries in this water solution and because of the buoyancy and the, of that sugar that sugar in that water brown sugar the larvae float right to the top so you get to pick out all the larvae and count them how many larvae are in there we'll find thousands of larvae and just just two pounds of cherries we'll find a thousand to two thousand um small small maggots <laughs> in the in the fruit that's kind of funny because we get if we get um some we get undergraduates that come here to work seasonally in the summer just for just for work um to find out more about this they're biology students and when they leave here they say i never want to eat a fruit again <laughs> we say, no no you, you just got to understand that insects are part of our food um, it really is they are a part of our food and they always will be you can't eradicate insects and you never will be able to eradicate them from our food or our environment. We have to try to control them to a level where they don't damage our food so bad that we don't have any food. So by boiling it, yeah, there, there's gonna be some larvae that come out. Um, if you let, let them sit in the sun or if you put them in a Ziploc bag and you sit them in the sun, you'll see the same thing. Um, they'll start emerging, they'll start leaving the fruit because it's too hot. Um, it's not a not a very good environment. So they try to leave and find something else. So when you boil them, it's too hot. So they start to come out. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what happens. Um, and it's, it's not a problem. And that's with any fruit. If you boil any fruit, you'll find that with vegetables too. Um, not just fruit. That's just, just an easy one to, to put in a pot and boil, I suppose. Um, and they probably emerge quicker in the strawberries because it's such a soft fruit. But um, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's just added protein, right? <laughs> it's not, it's, it definitely won't hurt you. And it's not a foreign pest. It's just a, just another larva that, um, that's a part of our food chain. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's how, that's how it works. Lar larvae and insects in our food and insects in anything we eat, really. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, oh, I, I, had, I had another. Hold on one minute, hold on, hold on one minute um, Tony. We have another question. OK. OK. If it takes six years to register uh, pesticides, how do you stay on top of the invasive species?
Well, let me see. Well, invasive species like spotted wing drosophila, I mean, you have to start you have to start researching spotted wing drosophila as soon as you can, whenever you can. Um, um, so, yeah, to register a crop on spotted wing drosophila, you have to, yeah, you have to start early. We started 10 years ago on registering products, um, but that's a good point. You need it now because it's destroying the crops. And there actually is a government it's called, you could look it up again, but I think it's called 28C. It's called an emergency registration. And there are ways to register pesticides um, in a very fast streamlined fashion. Hmm. They do have to come back and, do, and finish the data. But if crops are being devastated and there's, if there's gonna be no cherries left, um, there are ways to do quick, very quick, data and produce enough of it to do an emergency streamline registration um, to create a fast label, legal label for, say, spider wing drosophila. Um, Europe, like I said, banned neonics because um, they are hardened, hard on bees and they had to do an emergency registration. I think I maybe I mentioned that, but they came back and said, we're in trouble. We need to re-register neonics like now mm -hmm. they came and said europe is is reintegrating yeah they said we we have to re-register it like right now because we have a problem we 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 made it illegal and now we want it legal again because we're losing all our blueberries <laughs> right, right. There's a way to do it but that's not that's not what we do all the time that's just emergency situations generally there's enough time to create the data um there's other products to use on invasives, not just um, new ones. A lot of things that are already registered for flies, like spotted wing drosophila, can be easily put on the label just because there's it's already registered, not on that specific insect. But you can make it legal on an insect with a product that's already registered. But in order to get a new product on a new invasive insect, that's going to take a lot longer unless there's some emergency situation. Yeah. So suppose, so suppose some of their compounds, my students' compounds, um, showed great activity, good activity against these larvae. What mm -hmm. would be like the next step in the in this process to make them become, you know, like? widespread commercial or whatever mm. well if you made that product with your own ingredients and there's nothing in those ingredients that came from another company you would try to patent that ingredient you would go to a patenting company or a patent lawyer and you'd try to get that patent on your new invention because mm -hmm. it's considered a new invention and you would try to get it put your stamp on it so nobody can copy it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first step to, if, with any big experiment success, you would try to put your name on it so no one can take it away from you. Mm -hmm. Because like at, even at Michigan State, if we come up with something, Michigan State owns it. I don't own it. My boss doesn't own it. Michigan State owns it. Because right. this is the state's research. Mm -hmm. So Michigan State, we got to try to put Michigan State's name on it and make it a Michigan State thing. So you have to make it, put Michigan State patent on it. And once your patent gets on it, you have to take it to the EPA, USDA, and um, say, hey, I've got something new here. And we would like um, to make this legal. And they, they would send you through the paperwork. And um, if it's a minor use crop, they'd probably send you to IR4. <laughs> The program I work for, because um, we receive we, we receive a lot of new compounds from small companies um, nearby. You may have heard a company close to your school. Actually, I know several people from Vesteron. It's a company at I think they're using Western University's campus right now because it's such a small company. Uh -huh. um, but they've created several unique products using um, spider venom. Oh, yeah, Which, about 10 years ago, I think we had yeah. somebody from that company talk to my students. 
Okay. Very, very nice. Probably maybe Dan Peck. <laughs> yeah. Um, probably was Dan. Um, but yeah, they, that's a really, they have a lot of unique products there. So they, um, once you come up with something, you try to make it legal with the government, government paperwork, and you have to make it legal through programs like either IR4 or um, another chem chemical company. You go to them and say, are you guys interested in this sort of thing? Because it takes a lot of money um, to get a product to go through right. a lot of resources. So they say, well, okay, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll, um, we'll get, the, get the ball rolling and try to get the data we need because there has to be efficacy data. Does it work on the insect? The crop safety data, is it safe on the crop? Um, residue data, is it safe for human consumption? That sort of thing. Um, can humans eat that and be okay with it? Uh, so it, it takes time. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, it's uh, about five to two. And if you guys don't have any more questions, I think we could... Uh, Give Dr. Tony Van Roekum a good round of applause. Oop, I think I lost you. Thank you. We will be keeping in touch with you, telling you about yeah. progress. I sent you, I think, a list of our projects. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. And so we'll keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very. It's it. It's Thank very you. very interesting. I'll, I'll tell you, this is a, a very good topic to cover in science because it covers everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I could, I, could, I could tell you from a from a person who's been in school a long time in the sciences, this covers every single it, it corner does. of science. It does. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> and there's so many challenges still remaining. Oh yeah, this this is only the surface of what's out there. So lots of research available, and it's um, people who like to be outdoors and do science outdoors. It's a good option. That's right. That's right. Okay, so we'll stay in touch. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Bye. Talk to you soon. Okay. Yep. Bye bye.